We're up to the fourth book of the Torah, which is always read on the Shabbat right before Shavuot. And the name of the book is really in Hebrew, Bamidbar, which means in the wilderness. And we know it as the book of numbers. And the title of this class is, Do We Count? And we're going to talk about counting. Because the book of Numbers is going to detail what originally was supposed to be a relatively short period of time with the Jewish people now prepared to leave Mount Sinai just over a year not after leaving Egypt, and which means it's about, um, right, just over a year after leaving Egypt. And the intention was that the Jewish people would gather, receive their marching orders, literally, which is what the Torah is going to talk about in the beginning, and then travel together and move on under Moshe's leadership to the border of the land of Israel, and then to enter the land and conquer it, just has been set out from the very beginning, from the moment that Moshe was at the burning bush. We know, because we know the story, that it doesn't work out that way, that there are disruptions Ultimately, due to the sin of the spies, this period of time stretches to be 40 years in total. And in fact, due to other complications, Moshe himself ends up not leading the Jewish people into the land of Israel. So that's the scenario of the book. The book begins with a census being taken. And we're gonna, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about really the book of Bamidbor, chapter one. But first, I want to just share the screen for a moment. I want to put up a diagram, which is very dear to me. Um, and um, let's see how I can. Can everyone see the diagram okay? Diagram at the top of the page. And this diagram was created by students in the Hebrew Day School really um, probably more than 35 years ago. But what it depicts is the layout of the camp of the Jewish people in the wilderness. And I want to just take a moment to look at it and understand it. The center point right in the middle, and I, can you see my, um, my cursor there? Um, the center point is the Mishkan itself. This direction is east, and you see on the east side, which is right here, the three tribes that lead the way as the Jewish people travel, and that's the tribe of Yehuda, the tribe of Yisachar, and the tribe of Zvulun. So the Jewish people don't march north, but they march east with that being the leading edge. When they camp, they camp the same way every single time. When every, the Jewish people throughout their journey in the wilderness, every time they move, they move under the guidance of the cloud of Hashem. And when they encamp, they know exactly how to do so because each tribe has its area. Each family within that tribe has its space. And they're surrounding the tent of meeting, which is at the middle. And the inner circle is inhabited by Moshe and Aaron on the east side, again, the leading side. And then the three other families of Levites Gershon, Kahas, and Merari surrounding the other sides. And then the general population of the Jewish people, each grouped according to their tribe on the outside. Now, Rabbi Hirsch sets a tone for the book of Bamidbar, for this fourth book of the Torah. And he says the following. He says, this is the book in which the Jewish people are tasked with actualizing what they learned with the Torah that was given at Mount Sinai. So again, just to take a very quick synopsis, we'll go back to the burning bush where Moshe is told by God from the bush itself, I'm going to task you with going to Egypt, leading the Jewish people out, bringing them to the land of Israel. And on your way, you're going to stop at Mount Sinai and, and I will there will be revelation at Sinai. And then you'll go on and enter the land. That was the scenario that was meant to take place. 
So here it is a year, they've celebrated, as we mentioned last week, they celebrated Pesach in Egypt before the Exodus took place on that very first year of the Exodus itself. And one year later for that year and that year alone, they celebrated the holiday of Passover again in the wilderness, right at the foot of Mount Sinai. Now they're finished, they're ready to move on. They gather, trumpets are made so that the Jewish people can break camp and they can move. All of this is meant to set the Jewish people up for success in actualizing the Torah. That's the point here. Now for the first time in history, a Jewish nation that had been redeemed from Egypt, that had arrived at Mount Sinai and heard God speaking to each and every one of them, and had, spent, had gotten a year interval, albeit with interruptions there too, but they built the Mishkan and they're centered around the Mishkan. Now is the time to say, okay, game on. The Jewish people are gonna fulfill the Torah. And we know just prospectively from having learned the book before, there's gonna be a lot of hiccups along the way. There's gonna be the sin of the spies. There's gonna be the rebellion of Korach. There'll be issues of complaining They'll be they'll, the, the Jewish people will have a rough time growing into their role as the people of God meant to fulfill the Torah on earth and to thereby inspire all mankind to be a, be a light unto the nations. So it's interesting to note now, with this setting in mind, why the um, why the book begins with counting. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at that. We're going to look at the first few sentences in chapter one, and we're going to contrast them with sentences that come a little bit later. And um, again, if, if you can unmute yourself just for a moment and just tell me you can see what we're talking about, that would be a big help for me. Is the screen clear and you can see the diagram on the top? You can see sentences one, two, and three of chapter one in front of you. And then it jumps ahead to, to sentence 49 in chapter one. Are we okay with that? I'll take that as a resounding yes. Second. Okay, good. Okay, now if I can get this off my screen, we'll be in good shape here. Okay, so let's read. The Lord spoke to Moshe in the Sinai desert in the tent of meeting on the first day of the second month in the second year after the exodus from the land of Egypt, just what we've talked about. The Mishkan has been built, it's been inaugurated the month before, it sits at the center of the camp, and now God speaks to Moshe. Su'u et rosh kol adat b'nei Yisrael, and I have words in red and blue here to be highlighted. The English translation here is take the sum of or count all the congregation of the children of Israel by families following their father's houses, a head count of every male according to the number of their names. Sentence three, for 20 years old and upwards, all who are fit to go out to the army in Israel, you shall count them by their legions, you and our own. So we have a census being taken. Various reasons for the sentence, sentence is given. I just want to highlight one reason that the Ramban states here. And that reason is this. Each member of the Jewish people has access to the leadership of Moshe and Aaron directly. The way they're going to count the people, and it, it's not at all clear, even the fact that it's a count is not so clear, but is that each Moshe and Aaron are going to travel to each tribe. Each and every member of the tribe is going to present themselves to Moshe and Aaron with a piece of paper that has their name on it. They'll hand it to Moshe and Aaron to be acknowledged as individuals. They will give the sum of the half shekel for the good of the community. And then Moshe will count them through and then record the census for each and every one of the tribes. Rashi, in his introduction to the book of Bamidbor, says, why count the Jewish people again? They were counted previously 
already. This is a different kind of account. There's many differences, but Rashi gives us an allegorical explanation, which is that a rich person who cherishes their money will often sit down in the evening, I imagine, and lay their money out on the table and count it again, 1 million, 2 million, or whatever, you know, modern days times, 1 billion, 2 billion, whatever the case might be, or 100, 200, whatever it is. But their money is precious to them. It gives them a sense of happiness and gladness and they're happy to recount it. So Rashi says that's the way God feels about the Jewish people. God is, is exuberant about this moment in the history of the world. And if you think about it, it makes sense. Because finally now, after 2,449 years of human existence, and having gone through 2,000 years of void, and having Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and then they go down and being enslaved, and now they're freed, and now they're unified and together they're no place they're in a wilderness but at least they're set up the mishkan the tent of meeting is at the center the leadership is moshe and aaron the rest of the levite family is in the center every jewish person has their place within the jewish people so we've got to count but now we're going to look at these little red highlights when it says su at rosh kol adat bnei yisrael take the sum of all the congregation. The truth is that's not what the word su'u means. It means to lift up, pick up their heads. Rabbi Foreman in an interesting discussion says that when you have to pick up someone's face to look at them, there's an element of the person being downtrodden, looking down, not, not sensing the full import of who they are. So hence counting involves this verbiage of counting involves a sense of elevating. And as I mentioned what the Ramban says, each member of the nation had a right to benefit from the personal attention of Moshe and Aaron. The, sen the census was an opportunity for every Jew to come before the father of the prophets, the Holy One of Hashem with his brother, and to be counted. There's practical reasons too given, but that's the elevate that fits in with the word su'u et rosh kol adat b'nei Israel. Lift up their heads. Next sentence, we have a word in blue here, which I hope you can see on the screen. From 20 years old and upwards, all who are fit to go out to the army in Israel, you shall count them. The word now is tifkidu, a different Hebrew word. And tifkidu is a word used often in several places in the Torah. And it's commonly more likely translated as to be remembered, that God remembered Sarah. Joseph, at the end of the book of Genesis, a brace, it says, a code, teeth code, God will remember us and redeem us. Don't, don't lose hope, no matter what's going to befall the Jewish people. So you have this sense here now of being appointed, being elevated, being remembered. And that's the insight I want to share with you in terms of counting, which is something that Rabbi Foreman spends a great deal of time understanding, and I think it has great import to it. And it has to do with this idea of do you count? What's going on here is this. If this is the moment, as Hirsch sets up, that the Jewish people are stepping out onto the world stage as active players, as a community, as a nation, camped in an organized way where every Jewish person is part of the whole, and every Jewish person has a role to play and cumulatively and in total, they represent the Machane Hashem, the encampment of God, literally, where God's presence is right in the center. So what's so important here is that each and every individual person lift up their head, accept their role, accept their responsibility, accept their appointment. And that's where the word tifko, their remembrance, the fact that they're being counted on, as we would say in English, for something important to take place. And that's where this book of numbers, it's not a book about counting. It's a book about each person 
feeling as though they count, taking responsibility for their actions. And I would just add the concept, what's daunting and what we're going to see as we study the book of Bamidbar is that several times the Jewish people say, let's go back to Egypt. And, and you just, it's so daunting to just think about that. I mean, it would be literally exactly like a group of Holocaust survivors after the war and after being liberated saying, oh, I want to go back to Auschwitz. I mean, how could somebody do that? And, and, and I just want to hold on to that analogy for one more second because I was recently reading some interesting ideas about the Eichmann trial that took place in Israel in 1961-62. When they called witnesses up to testify, so like in every court of law, a witness comes up and they say, state your name, and you say your name. Oftentimes you give your address when you're in formal courts. You have to identify yourself as an individual because you're about to give testimony. You're about to, to participate in a court of law. And one of the witnesses said, you want my name? And he rolled up his sleeve and he said, this has been my name. This was my name from 1940 until 1945. I didn't have a name. It was taken away from me. I was reduced to this number tattooed on my arm. But now, standing in the land of Israel, standing in a Jewish state, ready to testify in a court of law to hold the, the people who murdered six million Jews accountable, now I have a name. It's a profound thought here. And it's a profound thought when you think about the Jewish people being counted at the start of the of the of the clock ticking of the Jewish people becoming the actors which God focuses on in terms of the history of the world. And I think this is a big idea at the beginning of the book. It's a big idea today because you find more and more people feeling as though I have choices to make, but if I choose A or I choose B, what is the difference? Does it really matter? I'm a bag of chemicals. I don't really have free choice. You hear echoes of, of what really is the idea of, let's go back to Egypt. What were the Jewish people in Egypt? They were slaves. They had a task in front of them to complete, and if they didn't complete it, if they died in the middle, they were just replaced by somebody else. They became anonymous. They didn't have a name. They didn't have an identity. They didn't have a face. They didn't have a place amongst the human race to be distinct and to matter and to, as we say in English, to count, to be valuable and important. And that's the sense with which we begin this book of the Torah. And I just want to make another connection. If you look in Psalm 19, there's a phrase there. You know, we sing the song, Torah Tashem Tamima, the Torah of God is complete, it's perfect. Meshivat Nefesh, it restores the soul. And then it says, Pekude Hashem Yesharim. It uses the same word again, this word Pekude. And what does Pekude mean? It means those commandments, Hirsch explains, those commandments that give us responsibility over the world. And they give us gladness, gladness out of acting responsibly, out of taking on responsibility. The word picardon, which is related to this, is an item that I entrust you with. So if I'm going on a trip and I say, here's my ring, I'm giving it to you as a picardon, I'm giving it to you in trust so that you can safeguard it and you can watch it and protect it from me. So that when I want to resume wearing it, I, it's intact, and I'm trusting you with this job to do. Pekudei Hashem Yesharim. The Jewish people have pekudim. The mitzvahs of Hashem involve us just as the words that were said to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Ma'avda u'lishomra. They were given a job: serve the world, plant, grow develop and watch over it. 
safeguarded. And as the Medrash says there, by acting in consonance with the purpose of man and with the will of God, the whole world becomes elevated. Those are the ideas of Kedusha we talked about in the last book of the Torah, the book of Vayikra, the book of Leviticus, which had to do with the holiness of the Jewish people. So from the get-go, Adam and Eve and Gan Eden were told, guard the world. Utilize it as a picodon. God says, I'm entrusting the world to you. Okay? Sometimes it works out well. Sometimes it doesn't work out well. Sometimes we do our jobs and we elevate the world and we take this trust that God has placed within us and we shine. And at other times, we destroy the world. We take what was given to us for a purpose and we misuse it. We misappropriate it. We damage it. When the person comes back and says, where's my ring? Oh, I've been using it as a ball bearing in my uh, my machine over there. It's a little dented. It's a little banged up. It's not quite as round. I don't know if it'll go back on your finger or not, but here you can have it back. Irresponsible. So when it, when the, when King David writes a psalm, it says, Bekude Hashem Yesharim. The, 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 whatever God trusts and trusts with us with, with our lives, with our responsibility as Jewish people, with our mission amongst mankind, our historic mission to be a light unto the nation, they're straight, they're doable, they're, they're, we can live up to them. And in doing so, we become fulfilled. We reach a sense of of, of partnership with Hashem, which is something that, that is so elevating and so beautiful to, to behold. So let's just turn back here. This is, really sets the tone for the entire book, this fourth book of the Torah. We see the Jewish people surrounding Hashem's presence. We see an encampment where every Jewish person belongs where every Jewish person becomes recognized as an individual, where every Jewish person has their responsibility to fulfill. And we can understand that when people are getting used to living up to these expectations, there are times when they say, too much for me, too hard for me. God expects too much from me. I want to go, let me go back to Egypt and be nameless. Let me go back to a situation where I don't count and I don't matter. And the world just sees me as just another thing. And of course, that desire to escape from freedom and to, and to escape from the expectations that God rightfully places upon us, it really is analogous to a person who said, I'll go back to, I'll, I'm going to go back to being 011394. Don't call me by my name. I don't want that burden of responsibility. And of course, as the Jewish people, having experienced the miraculous exodus from Egypt, having experienced the special attention of God, the revelation at Sinai, having gathered together and built a mishkan, a tent of meeting that's inhabited by God Almighty, palpably living in the midst of, and now it's time to move. It's time to go on. It's been a year since the Exodus. It's been eight and a half months since you stood at Mount Sinai. Nine and a half months since you stood at Mount Sinai. It's time to move towards this goal of occupying the land of Israel, the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if we're going to get there, it's going to require each of us to count and to matter and to embrace the responsibility that Hashem has in mind for us. What a lofty way to begin a book of the Torah. What important ideas the Torah is placing. So when we think of the book of Numbers, that's what it is. It's numbers in the most elevated sense. I'm here, I count, I have a name, I have an identity, I have the wherewithal, to take on responsibility, to guard what's important, 
to serve what needs to be served, to elevate the world, and let's get started. And that's how the Book of Bamidbar begins, and we should all be inspired from it. Anyone has a question, I'd be happy to address it.